Well, I'll call the 17th September meeting of the Manhattan City Commission to order, and we'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. If you'll please rise and follow me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have a... Uh, special item tonight and uh, also be giving out some proclamations so I'd ask uh, Dan if you'll come forward and you'll be introducing your group and we're very proud to have VFW and American Legion here with us tonight in such numbers and look forward to this presentation. Ladies and gentlemen let me first start out this is this is an honor to do this and what this represents is Manhattan becoming the first city in the state of Kansas to be nationally recognized as a POWMIA city. Um, which goes with Riley County becoming the first county in the state of Kansas to be a POWMIA city. And I'm going to introduce the representatives from Jefferson Barracks in St. Louis. But I do have a bit of news after talking with them. Um, Kansas will be the second state in the nation to be a POWMI state, second to Missouri, which is where the project started. So let me, let me introduce Stephanie Roseland and Pat Kessler from Jefferson Barracks in St. Louis, Missouri. But I would also like to make a quick uh, recognition of the VFW members, the DAV members, and the American Legion that are here representing all veterans from the city of Manhattan. Good evening. Thank you so much for having us. My name is Stephanie Russline. I've been on the board of directors at the Jefferson Barracks POW MIA Museum for the past six years. I went to a meeting just like this, and I'm not a veteran, but I'm very proud to serve and honor my veterans. I'm a funeral director and a bomber. I went to a meeting, and I sat in the back of the room, and tears began rolling down my eyes, and I could not contain myself because I found after growing up in a funeral home and being a funeral director for the past 26 years that there's something much worse than burying your child or your parents or your brother or your sister, and it's this. It's not knowing where they're at or if they're ever going to come home. So I am very honored to be here, and I am very thankful for what you did to become one of our cities. Pat? Good evening. Thank you, Manhattan, Kansas. You are awesome. We are honored to be here this evening. The POW MIA Museum I have been associated with for 10 years. I'm their chief researcher and it's an amazing journey. But it also, without our veterans and without our veterans organizations, our auxiliary, our writers, our sons, the museum would never exist. The VFW has two board members and two auxiliary members and the same with the American Legion. So tonight is also a shout out to you and the work you have done for the veterans and the work you have done for Manhattan, Kansas. Thank you. Proclamation is presented to the city of Manhattan, Kansas. The mission of the Jefferson Barracks POW MIA Museum is to reverently honor all who served our country in a branch of the United States military, who were captured by enemies of the United States, or who are missing in action from any year and any conflict. As a part of this mission and in an effort to raise POW MIA awareness across the nation, the Jefferson Barracks POW MIA has established the POW MIA city and county programs. There are open invitations to towns, cities, municipalities, and counties across the country to join together with you museum to help ensure our promise that no one is left behind and no one is forgotten and that promise is kept. In alignment with the mission statement, the fundamental requirements for a city or county to become 
a POW MIA city or county is to actively participate in raising awareness of the American public regarding our POWs and MIA. It can be as simple as making sure that the PI POW MIA flag is flown at all municipal and county locations and educating its citizens as to what it stands for. With the addition of the great city of Manhattan, there are now 18 cities designated as POW MIA cities and three POW MIA designated counties, one of which is Riley County, Kansas. It is now our honor and privilege to so officially proclaim the city of Manhattan, Kansas as our newest POW city. Maybe just a couple of things. Uh, number one, uh, on behalf of the Commission and all the citizens of Manhattan, uh, we gratefully accept this uh, plaque as well as the sign. And obviously in a city like Manhattan that cares so deeply for our military and our veterans, uh, we'll proudly display those items and make sure that uh, it's remembered fondly. You know, we've had the Memorial Auditorium behind us redone. Just uh, That just gives you an indication of how deeply we all care about the veterans who have served and those who are serving today. So on behalf of the commissioners and the city, we thank all of you very much. Before we leave, I'd like to get all of you up here so we can get a group photo. And so you have one more thing for I us? I have one okay. more thing. This is a challenge kind well, from the museum. You. And this is a book for you. This book came about very uniquely. We were at a convention for farmer POWs from World War II, and there was a softball convention going on. And to the chagrin of the poor coach, the little girl came up and said, what's a Palmia? <laughs> and so the coach kindly let us spend a half hour with his team, and we sat on the floor of the Holiday Inn and explained what a Palmia was. <laughs> And because of that, we have wrote a book at the museum about POWs and MIAs and their families, and it's written for children. So I'm very honored yeah. to present well, this you to much. you. Thank you. We can find a great place for that. Thank you. We have a couple of proclamations uh, that are very meaningful. Uh, one that is, ties on uh, pretty close to what we've just done, and that is Constitution Week. The uh, United States of America is singularly blessed to have a Constitution that guides us to this day, starting from our very founding. That's a document that is probably unique in history. Uh, something that is a touch tone that we use today, not only in our legislature, but also in our, in our Supreme Court. So uh, I just ask that on this Constitution designated week that everybody refresh their memory. There's a lot of little nice booklets that you can get to uh, refresh your memory on 
the uh, Constitution of the United States. That's uh, very important. So Laura and Gail and Nancy and Kathy. Maybe just two, okay. <laughs> All right. So what we'll do is we'll have uh, Gary Fees read the proclamation and then uh, ask you to make any remarks you'd like to. Whereas September 17, 2019, marks the 232nd anniversary of the drafting of the Constitution of the United States of America by the Constitutional Convention. Whereas it is fitting and proper to officially recognize this magnificent document and the anniversary of its creation, and to officially recognize the patriotic celebrations which will commemorate the occasion. Now therefore, Michael Dodson, Mayor of the City of Manhattan, Kansas, proclaims September 17 through 23, 2019 as Constitution Week. Thank you, Mayor Dodson. We really appreciate this. And his words were excellent. And it couldn't be more humbling and emotional to be here on the, on the coattails of you guys. And what an important, um, an important proclamation for our county and our city as well. Um, I'm here representing, and Gail and I are here, and our other um, DAR uh, members ship are here in in honor of Polly Ogden chapter that's the Manhattan chapter of um, Daughters of the American Revolution and in 1955 they in their wisdom I think decided to um, ask Congress and the president to proclaim this week um, each year as Constitution Week and today is actually the 17th is actually the day the, the actual anniversary of the signing of the, of the Declaration of Independence and as it's been stated and as it's on the screen 232 years ago and we're so fortunate to live in a, a land where we have liberty and um, and we we share and enjoy so many freedoms and I concur with Mayor Dobson that it's a great um, document I was reading it today and and it's pretty amazing DAR exists so that we can promote patriotism, historic preservation, and educational causes across not just the United States, but actually we're international because we have DARs all over the globe. And um, our President General has challenged us to rise and shine. Um, and I just hope that as we promote the Constitution that we do that. Our state um, regent is Susan Metzger, and she's actually a Polly Ogden this year, so that's kind of neat. And her theme is Welcome Home. And I feel like, again, that really ties in with, with what we heard before, because one of our goals and one of our charter for the next three years is to welcome home our veterans and other um, men and women that serve in different capacities. Thank you again for this honor. This is also uh, recovery month, and um, I think this is quite fitting. We, we have recognized for some time that we've got some issues in the city of Manhattan, some of which are largely hidden from view, but should not be. Uh, we've worked very hard, and a lot of the commissioners behind me have been uh, primary in advancing this, along with Robin and some others. But one of the first things we did was place some professionals in our police department and the police department was open and accepting of that idea and I think we've all learned a great deal from it. They've also worked very hard for several years now to bring a facility to Manhattan that can serve us and the surrounding area to take care of people who should not be in jail but uh, should have a treatment facility that can serve them for a short period of time. So that facility is just about here, and uh, our only problem will be in the future is continuing funding, and Robin may say something about that. But I'd ask uh, Robin and Ann, Stan and Deanna to come on up. And
ask Gary to read the proclamation. Whereas behavioral health is an essential part of health and overall wellness, prevention works, treatment is effective, and people can and do recover from substance abuse and mental disorders. Whereas it is critical to educate our policymakers, friends, and family members, healthcare providers, and businesses, and that people should seek assistance for these conditions with the same urgency as they would any other health condition. Whereas the U.S. Department of Health and Human Sciences, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy, and Pawnee Mental Health Services observe Recovery Month to raise awareness and understanding of recovery from substance abuse and mental disorders. Now therefore, Michael Dodson, Mayor of the City of Manhattan, Kansas, proclaims September 2019 as Recovery Month. I want to start just by thanking the mayor and thanking our city commissioners for all the support that they've given to this uh, community crisis stabilization center that we're about to open up. It, uh, it's something that's been in the works for a couple of years and it started probably in 2015 when there was a reported sexual assault at Osawatomie State Hospital and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services came in and inspected Osawatomie State Hospital and found that there were unsafe and crowded conditions there. That resulted in a moratorium on admissions, which basically meant that people who needed inpatient treatment weren't able to access it when they needed it. And so our hospital emergency rooms um, began seeing individuals who should have been in a hospital receiving inpatient psychiatric care. Um, they were being held in emergency rooms, intensive care units. Our law enforcement officers increasingly came into contact with individuals in the community who needed inpatient psychiatric treatment but who weren't receiving the treatment that they needed. And that was happening all over the state. It wasn't just a Riley County or City of Manhattan issue. And members of the city of Manhattan were so critical to getting the state's attention. Um, there are several people here tonight who were a part of that initial team that traveled to Topeka and met with then Secretary Tim Keck, um, Assistant Director Muldrup, Commissioner Reddy. Um, we had another representative from the, the city offices. We had a county commissioner go with us. We had a consumer of mental health services go with us. And we had an opportunity to present our needs before then Secretary Tim Keck. That conversation really was the beginning then of a fruitful effort to contract with the state of Kansas for a grant to help pay for startup costs for this crisis stabilization center here in Manhattan. We're on the eve of opening that facility. If you have a pencil, you might pencil in October 17th or 18th. We haven't finalized the date of an official rib ribbon cutting, but we have confirmation from the secretary of KDADS, uh, Laura Howard, that she is going to make herself available to be here for that ribbon cutting. And so as soon as we know a precise time for that, we'll let you and other members of the public be aware of that because we, we would really value uh, your participation in that and especially the participation of our city commissioners who have been so supportive and so key to um, the opening of this facility. So I'd, I'd like to just for a second mention, pause to say that yes, this is recovery month. I appreciate that our city is proclaiming September as recovery month. I think it's also interesting to note that uh, suicide prevention week falls within recovery month and World Suicide Prevention Day uh, in fact was last week. The reason I think that that is so important is because when people lose hope of recovery from mental illness or substance use disorders, that increases the risk 
that they might attempt suicide. And the, the Centers for Disease Control offer a couple of pieces of information that I think really help um, put some perspective on this. Between 1996 and 2016, the U.S. suicide rate increased by 25.4 percent. But uh, more alarmingly is that the Kansas suicide rate during that same period of time increased by 45 percent. We have to do something about that. It's even more alarming that our youth are increasingly turning to suicide as a way to cope with their loss of hope. Uh, in 2017, there were 99 Kansas youth between the ages of 10 and 19 who took their own life. And those tragic statistics made Kansas the eighth in the nation on a per capita basis for the amount of youth suicide. Uh, our Attorney General for the state of Kansas recognizes this is a serious problem. He named the first ever youth suicide prevention coordinator, um, Gina Meyer Hummel has taken on that position and her job will be to take a look at this issue of youth suicide in the state of Kansas and come up with recommendations for how we can have a, an impact on that. So I think that the important thing for us to remember is that treatment does work uh, and recovery is possible. So thank you again for giving us this opportunity. to uh, part four, which is commissioner comments, and start, Linda. Um, I'd just like to welcome the planning 316 class members that are here tonight. Thank you for coming. That's our, maybe your first city commission meeting. <laughs> And uh, it's just the way our government works, and it's a good lesson. So, in, uh, and we want to be sure that you, um, if you have any questions, talk to us afterwards. We'll still be here. Okay, I want to invite everybody to, you know, Friday, 4.30 to 6 p.m., the Johnny Call Plaza is going to be dedicated. And uh, you can go on a fun run if you want to dress up like Johnny Call. There's a look-alike contest. You can win a prize for that and there'll be some Johnny Call little pancake cookie things 300 of those to be passed out so it should be a, a really fun event and uh, that project's been about 18 months and and getting done and I just want to be sure everybody realizes that was not done with tax dollars okay that was all donations from local business the community came together the statue is refurbished and everything's in place except for a couple of plaques that hopefully will get uh, Put in place there before Friday so be sure to show up at uh, 4 30 the weather looks like it's going to be fine and it should be a great event <laughs> uh, maybe just to mention that uh, we want to thank Lori Bishop and the Volunteer Center as well as some other agencies the Greater Manhattan Community Fund and the Armed Forces Community Fund for putting on the 9-11 Remembrance Ceremony up at Bishop Stadium. Uh, well attended and we'll just continue to grow. So again, this is a recognition of all of the first responders, the firemen, the policemen, the uh, EMS, and anyone else who had a, a hand in helping on that, uh, on that infamous day. So I think she did a great job and we had, uh, we're honored to have the Governor of Kansas there, as well as some other dignitaries, so uh, very well done. So with that, we'll turn to item 
<clears throat> five, which is the consent agenda. The consent agenda are those items that are either considered administrative in nature or those items that have been previously considered by the commission. So at this time, I would ask that anyone on the uh, commission who has a question or comment on the consent agenda. Uh, I would just like to comment that I'm, uh, it, it's important that we have closure with Pottawatomie County on the uh, building codes where they're uh, agreeing that our inspection and our inspectors will be, will respond to new construction needs that, for inspectors. And that's a big deal for two government units like that to cooperate. And it's taken a year or 18 months. And I want to give a lot of credit to Brad Clausen, our, uh, the, oh gosh, assistant fire chief in charge of, I don't know what. Just about everything. Everything. Okay, got it. But <laughs> I think his, uh, his uh, careful uh, coordination and the Flint Hills builders, uh, I want to give credit to them and all who work together to, to make this joint uh, uh, effort possible. And that is item K on our agenda. And um, so that was, that was important that we recognize that partnership. I want to highlight item J, which is the Manhattan Levy right-of-way project. It's $352,000. Very important that we continue with this project. And you might remember in July, the City Commission approved a partnership with U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to take care of that project. Now, that's actually about $10.5 million when all said and done. So this is just a, a part of it. And it also looks like it'll be maybe a 20-year bond that may pay for it, which is going to be about 2.2 mills on the property tax for each year over the next 20 years. That's one way of funding it. Another way of funding it would be the possible passing of the 0.3% uh, sales tax that's coming up here in November. So I wanted everybody to understand the implications of those two things because this project is well along. We've pretty much committed uh, the 10.5 million and the levy is gonna be put in place. And the other point is I've gotten some email from folks over in Dick's Edition and Northview wanting to know, well, why is this important? Because the levy doesn't protect me personally, my house in that area, because the levy does not extend far enough to protect all of that. But it's important for anybody that lives in that area to to recognize that the levy does protect the city water department, and that serves the entire city. And if uh, water were to come over that levy, uh, it would be a disaster to lose our water department, and that would affect everyone citywide. Absolutely. And so it's very important that this particular uh, project uh, get completed. If you know the, the history of, of the levy, I think it was completed in 1963, and it needs major maintenance and some other things. And so to me, this is the, the number one, you know, priority thing that we have to get done. And if you're curious about what would happen if the levee wasn't there, just Google the 1951 flood, 53 flood, and take a look at what downtown looked like. And that's something we just can't allow to have happen again. All right, we'll ask for uh, public comment. Anyone wishing to comment on any item on the consent agenda, please come forward. And Love to hear from you. All right, seeing none, we'll, we'll now go back to the commission to entertain a motion. If I could, I'd like to uh, echo uh, Commissioner Morris's statement uh, about the Brad's team as well as Katie's team that uh, work with Pottawatomie County to, to put that agreement together. But I also want to especially recognize Brad Clausen uh, this is his last city commission meeting before he retires next week. So he's happy about that. I want to thank him for uh, all his service that he's done for the city of Manhattan. Appreciate it, Brad. Are we going to get an opportunity to see him in person somewhere? All right, good. Okay, I'll make the motion that we approve the consent agenda. Second. Call the roll, please. 
Mayor Dodson. Yes. Commissioner Reddy. Yes. Commissioner Butler. Yes. And Commissioner Morris. Yes. Motion carries four to zero. Just so the public knows, uh, Commissioner McKee is uh, absent tonight. He's on business on the East Coast, and I think this is the first one he's missed, so we appreciate his service here, too. Uh, we'll move to item six, which is the general agenda, and we'll start with item A. And item A is to consider the first reading of an ordinance adopting the standard traffic ordinance for Kansas City's, the addition of 2019. So Wes Garrison, Assistant City Con Attorney, will be presenting. Oh, thanks, Wes. <laughs> yes. All right. Good evening, Mayor Dodson, Commissioners. Uh, I do have the privilege of presenting to you today the 2019 STO Adoption Ordinance, as well as a proposed micro-mobility ordinance that uh, deals with electronic assisted scooters. The mm -hmm. uh, presentation will be in two parts. The first part will deal with the standard traffic ordinance, adoption ordinance, and the second, uh, second part will deal with the micromobility ordinance. As far as some background is concerned, what is the STO? Each year, the League of Kansas Municipalities drafts the uh, standard traffic ordinance. Um, it's based on the Kansas Traffic Act and the league publishes it every year. The city adopts that um, ordinance, incorporates it by reference through the city code every year. We also incorporate uh, additions, modifications, and deletions from that STO, and we publish that in section 3117 of the code. Uh, state law limits um, the ability to change certain things within the STO, uh, but the cities do have the ability to change certain aspects of that. As far as the uh, legal department work, what we've done, uh, we reviewed the 2019 STO for those changes between the last year's version and this year's version. Um, we cross-reference those with the city code to check for any conflicts or any concerns with existing codes. Um, and then we sent off to the other city departments for any feedback as well as to Raleigh County Police Department for any, for any feedback that they have on the 2019 STO and those changes. Uh, we didn't receive any feedback that was negative or concerning or uh, any desire to make any changes. As far as what's actually in the 2019 uh, STO, no major changes in the law. That's pretty standard um, except for e-scooters. That was an addition this year that's garnered a lot of attention by this commission and other, other cities. Um, the updates that were made to the STO were done so in order to um, correspond with the existing state law that's either been in existence for a while or if there was a Senate bill or a House bill that was passed that affected state law, these changes were incorporated to have some consistency. Uh, specifically, there were a lot of additions additional definitions and amendments to definitions just so that they matched what the state law says. Specifically with uh, electric assisted scooters, uh, they defined it in subsection one and what an electric assisted scooter is, otherwise known as an e-scooter, and they regulate that in 135.1. They defined it, um, as you can see, a self-propelled vehicle that has two wheels in contact with the ground, an electric motor, motor, handlebars, a brake, and a deck that is designed to be stood upon when riding. And you'll note that uh, it's the same as the Kansas statute there. Section 135.1, subsection A, uh, makes it unlawful to operate an e-scooter on an interstate, federal, or state highway here in Manhattan. Uh, a person would not be able to ride an e-scooter on Tuttle Creek Boulevard, Fort Riley Boulevard, Seth Child Road, or uh, East Points Avenue, except if they were crossing that street to another road. Um, and that's, that's indicated in subsection D, that exception there. Um, subsection B uh, essentially indicates that e-scooters are to be treated just like bicycles. Um, that, which means that riders must follow the traffic laws 
as any other vehicle on the road. They are subject to the same duties that a driver of any other vehicle is subject to. Uh, riders are subject to the same rules as bicycles, those extra rules that are implied on bicycles. Specifically, no more than one rider on a bicycle at a time, um, no clinging to vehicles, the ride, the bike rider must ride on uh, bike paths where those are available, and the uh, vehicle or the, the bike must have proper lighting when it's riding at night. Subsection C uh, grants the governing body the authority to regulate e-scooters further than what the STO does, uh, including prohibition in the city at all. So you could, as a governing body, prohibit them from being in the city at all. That's not what I believe the commission's intent was. Um, and so the draft ordinance that's before you uh, leaves it alone. It does not make any changes to those uh, regulations on 135.1. It is the city, um, it's the recommendation of the city administration that the commission approve the first reading of this ordinance incorporating by reference the 2019 STO with amendments as set forth in the ordinance. Are there any questions regarding the STO specifically? There were a lot of uh, definitions in this one, which I think is helpful. And uh, the other thing that uh, caught my eye, and we talked about it when we were up at uh, the radio station this morning, is uh, in the past, evidently, there's been some um, some discussion about whether or not when stopped a, uh, a driver had to produce his driver's license or physically hand it to the patrolman. And uh, so this one makes that clear. It does. Um, the other one that I had a little bit of trouble with was the difference between a ATV and a UTV. Um, you know, it, it references both in there and then gives specific abilities, particularly for an ag purpose to be operated on a highway for a short period of time. Yes, that's correct. Uh, they, do, they do treat the two different, the vehicles differently. Um, and the city actually amends on the ATVs and allows them in streets that are 30 miles an hour mm -hmm. um, or below. So, and those were minor, the, the changes that you did see in the AT, ATV specifically regarding ag was, was a pretty minor change. Yeah. It, it, required drivers for ag purposes to meet certain certain qualifications so yeah i think this is becoming more common in more places too and i'm glad we have the uh, authority to make our own decisions as far as regulation for some of them i am concerned about the speed can't travel more than 10 miles so i know we're going to discuss that in the next uh, outline here that you have before us uh, so i still don't understand Geocaching. I don't. I don't understand that concept. We can talk about that more later, okay. or if you want to talk about it now, we can talk about that now. It's, if, it's if up to you. If we hold it for the second one, it might be part. more appropriate because that's where the technology is being applied. Yeah. Yeah. And geocaching won't have anything to do with the STO, if that, if okay. that makes sense. Yeah, there are two different. I just didn't two know how to things. regulate them. But I think what we have now. I remember discussing this almost uh, a year ago, maybe even more than that, and uh, there was. Uh, the K-State students definitely weren't sure, did not want this here for a variety of reasons because they were just becoming uh, a hazard or a nuisance in other communities and we didn't have anything in place. Right. So I think the state now found a reason that we need to have this in place and I'm glad we're going to start updating everything that we have in place. And the second part of this is going to get into more details about what, what we can and cannot do. Uh, but regulation is going to be key because even with the bicycles we have in place, uh, the residents or the car drivers are still trying to figure out some of those uh, spaces and areas and uh, maintaining that um, responsibility between the bicyclists and the, between the auto drivers. And this is going to add to that. So I think those are some complications and challenges. We'll see what happens with that. And campus is completely different, so I don't know how sure. they're going to handle it on campus. But as far as the city, I'm glad we're starting to look at some um, key components for the STO. And RCPD was involved in this, which is the other good enforcement piece of it. Uh, I'm curious how Triangle Park in Aggieville is treated. 
if you would. Uh, we've talked with the university over the last year, actually, uh, with regard to e-scooters, and that was something I was concerned about. So I wanted to be sure to ask. I, you know, we treat uh, the scooters like we do bicycles, but then there are certain areas, and uh, I uh, just wondered if you could explain that for the okay, public and yeah. It's university land. I don't know. I'm asking. It, if it deals with, is it university land? So or yes. It? Triangle Park is in Aggieville. Yeah. Uh, and later, at the next uh, segment, we're going to talk about amending an ordinance to not allow bicycles on sidewalks in Aggieville. Okay. Uh, we, we already don't allow bicycles on sidewalks in Aggieville. We're not going to allow e-scooters on sidewalks in Aggieville, and I think that would include Triangle Park. The whole park, not just the, tri the sidewalks around Triangle Park. So we're also going to come back with um, a parks and rec, a parks and rec ordinance that would allow uh, micro mobility solutions in parks and trails. However, uh, because we do not allow e-scooters on sidewalks in Aggieville, you wouldn't be able to use the e-scooter in Triangle Park. That would be an exception. I just wanted something on the record. Thank you. Any other questions about the STO? Well, so just. Uh we just one minute we'll ask if there's any uh, public comment on this and then we'll take care of the part one here so at this point is there any public comment on the sto okay seeing none we'll come back to the commission for a, a motion yes i move we approve first reading of an ordinance incorporating by reference the standard traffic ordinance for Kansas City's edition of 2019 with amendments as set forth in the ordinance. Second. Call the roll, please. Commissioner Reddy. Yes. Commissioner Butler. Yes. Commissioner Morse. Yes. And Mayor Dodson. Yes. Motion carries 4-0. Item B is to consider the first reading of an ordinance relating to riding and parking bicycles, micro mobility devices and similar devices on city property and regulation of micro mobility network companies upon city property again it'll be uh, Wes Garrison presenting uh, thank you again mayor Dodson commissioners um, so as noted um, STO the STO does not regulate uh, areas other than the streets predominantly there are a few exceptions to that but uh, the STO will not or does not regulate e-scooters on uh, city sidewalks, city parking lots, city parking garages, Aggieville downtown districts as it relates to uh, sidewalks and plazas, uh, parks and recreation facilities, or the rideshare companies themselves. The STO does not regulate those, and so as a result of that, um, we have uh, we are proposing amendments to current. Um, ordinances that deal with some of these issues and specifically what what's come up in th basically three key um, concerns both from this commission as well as a lot of meetings with s separate staff is that the use of these devices or the operation of these devices is one concern parking of these devices is the second concern and arguably the third and the biggest concern is the rideshare companies and the second ordinance before you addresses these concerns um, going to section 31181 currently um, as it is right now that section pro prohibits riding bicycles skateboards and roller skates in zone c3 and c4 districts that's aggieville and downtown you cannot ride on the sidewalks with those devices it also prohibits skateboards or roller skates being in public parking lots or being ridden on the streets and again except across uh, current section 31 182 prohibits bicycles uh, from parking on the sidewalks except in racks and business districts and on curbing in other parts of the city um, 31181 was adopted prior to 1973. It was last amended in 1990. Um, and this ordinance, 31182, was also adopted prior to 1973. The second ordinance, or the micromobility ordinance, is before you today, um, updates these sections, provides newer uh, updated language, 
and provide some um, incorporation of newer devices so that it's a little more up to date. So we've used that word micromobility and I don't know if anybody knows exactly what that is yet. So we defined what that is. We wanted to keep in mind that e-scooters are just one part of a group of devices that a lot of these uh, rideshare companies are using. Um, they also include devices that are becoming more popular within cities. Micromobility is a term that's often used to describe these devices that are lightweight and that travel small distances. Um, new section 181, 31181 uh, defines what a micromobility device is. As you can see, it includes electric assisted bicycles, e scooters. Uh, motorized skateboards, one-wheel boards, hoverboards, self-balancing skateboards, and similar devices. Um, because some of these rideshare companies also deploy regular bicycles, we wanted to include those bicycles within that definition of micromobility. And so bicycles that are owned or operated by a micromobility network company would fit the definition of micromobility device. And giving some examples, here are some e-scooters, which you're all probably pretty familiar with by now. You've seen them quite a bit. Um, this is a couple examples of electric-assisted bicycles. And the item on the left, the one-wheel board, otherwise known as a self-balancing skateboard or self-balancing board, and then a hoverboard on the right. Um, Micromobility encompasses several devices, and so unfortunately, definitions of these things vary. When you say hoverboard or self-balancing board, you could mean a variety of things. Um, some have not been clearly defined by the state. Uh, the first reading definition of micromobility devices does exclude electronic personal assistive devices. Well, the problem is, however, we, we discovered that the electronic personal assistive device are actually what we've been calling hoverboards. So the items there in red, that item in red is referred to as an electric personal assistive device. Um, so we need to change that definition slightly uh, to include that. I also want to add that we wanted to exclude, exclude motorized wheelchairs. Um, we wanted to make it clear that devices that are used by individuals who have physical disabilities would not be included in the micromobility devices. Um, and so we need, to, we need to change that and add that to the definition as an exclusion as well. So those minor changes uh, will be made for the second reading of this ordinance um, and they will be accompanied by a memo that explains why we think we need to make those changes. So going back to the, those three concerns that I mentioned, the first concern uh, was the operation or the writing of these devices. <coughs> New section 31182 uh, prohibits bicycles, micromobility devices, skateboards, roller skates, roller blades, um, and similar devices from riding in that Aggieville and downtown district. <coughs> it maintains what is already on the books right now, which is a, a prohibition of those devices being ridden on the sidewalk down in C3 and C4 zones. Um, the section also prohibits riding uh, within or upon city parking lots or city parking garages. Here's a, a quick table, so to speak, that just kind of gives you a visual of the types of devices that we're talking about here and whether they're allowed on the what, what, whether they will be allowed on the streets or the sidewalks. Um, as you can see, all of them are allowed on the sidewalks and some of them are allowed on the streets, but not all are allowed on the streets. Um, continuing, West, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. Isn't a hoverboard, hoverboard, maybe you already mentioned this, it's electronic, isn't it? It's what? Electronic? Yes, yes, it's, it's an electronic motor. But it's, it goes on the sidewalk? Correct. Okay. And. And the difference for why it doesn't go on the um, street, I didn't understand, I guess. I thought all electric ones are going on the street. No, an electric hoverboard, and I'll go back to electronic hoverboard, or what's called a electric personal assistive, uh, is the deal on the right, this item here. Right, okay. 
Um, E-scooters, electric assisted scooters, are these devices here, electric assisted bicycles here. Does that answer your question, or Commissioner? I guess. Um, I just thought because it was electric that somehow those were automatically going on the street, and except for the bicycles. But right. What this chart tells you is that um, bicycles, electronic assisted bicycles, electronic assisted scooters, and motorized bicycles are allowed in the streets. And those other devices, uh, hoverboards, one wheel boards, motorized skateboards, uh, roller skates, roller blades, and regular skateboards are not allowed to be ridden in the streets. And that's, that's current law. That's what the STO already has in place and has been in place for quite some time. Okay, you, you probably explained it earlier and I just got confused after seeing all that. Uh, Thank you. Um, any other questions on, on those, on that question? Okay. Um, so continuing the uh, first concern, these provisions, uh, we, we added some conduct provisions for when these devices are actually being ridden on the sidewalks, um, where they're allowed to be ridden. These provisions were added to protect the safety of the riders of these devices, as well as the pedestrians that are going to be sharing these sidewalks. Um, they must yield right away to pedestrians on those sidewalks. They must give an audible signal when overtaking or passing individuals who are walking and they must tra travel at a reasonable or prudent speed and prudent speed no greater than 15 miles an hour. Um, and reasonable and prudent speed, you know, on a normal bright sunny day, 10 miles an hour might be reasonable and prudent, but depending on weather conditions or perhaps there's an event going on at that time, 10 miles an hour on a sidewalk that's a busy sidewalk with pedestrians may not be reasonable and prudent. And so that gives an officer who's enforcing the, this specific ordinance some discretion to observe that and then ultimately no greater than 15 miles an hour on the sidewalks. The second major concern uh, was parking and in the new ordinance 31-183 uh, we address bicycles, e-scooters and electric bicycles and other similar devices. It indicates that you can only park those devices in city approved racks or designated areas within those C3 and C4 districts, specifically Aggieville and downtown. Um, that, that's how it is currently with bicycles. They're, they're supposed to park in those designated areas. Um, and also that they only park on street side curbing or in city approved racks or designated areas, essentially everywhere else in the city. Now that is to say that does not prevent a person who's riding one of these devices from parking on private property where they have such authority. So the third concern I mentioned earlier was the rideshare companies. Um, so we wanted to define those other than just saying rideshare company. We, we needed to indicate exactly what that was. The um, STO provided us some guidance when it related to Uber and Lyft and those types of deals, but micromobility is a, is a separate animal. So this is the definition that we have proposed to the commission, uh, essentially a corporation that uses a digital network to connect these devices uh, to operators, or of uh, the riders to the operating uh, devices for transportation. So what that means is Companies like Lime, Bird, Vio Ride, uh, those would be included in micromobility network company. However, that would not include Green Apple Bikes. The distinction there is that Green Apple Bikes does not use a digital network to connect the devices to the riders. So um, if there's any concern that this would include Green Apple Bikes, and that would be a concern that that's not accurate. It, Green Apple Bikes are exempt from that. It's, it does not fit within that definition. So micromobility company, um, network company agreements, we've discussed before, I think the meeting that was held a few months ago, there was mention that one of the ways that you can control these um, rideshare companies from entering into your city or when they do enter your city is to have some sort of agreement, to get ahead of the curve and try to have an agreement with them. New section 31-184 requires 
these companies to enter, in a, enter into an agreement with the city prior to operating on city streets, city sidewalks, or rights of way. Um, and the cost of removal of the devices from the rights of way, sidewalks, and city streets um, would be assessed to that company or any person acting on behalf of that company. And as I said, that essentially allows the city to control a lot of the concerns that come with these rideshare companies. Um, you can address, as that slide indicates, you can address equipment, geofencing, geofencing um, operation hours, your insurance, um, serving underserved geographical areas, all those, all those concerns can be addressed through those agreements. Um, I know, uh, Commissioner Reddy, you mentioned geocaching. I think you were referring to geofencing. I heard both those terms, and I, I understand fencing a little bit, yeah. um, but not the other, and I don't even know if I'm saying it right. Sure. I, I think geocaching is where you deposit something and somebody hunts for it and finds it. That's my understanding of what geocaching is. But geofencing is where you have zoned areas and GPS can kind of control where those items operate. I'm not so sure how accurate that is. I'll leave that up to Jared um, on what research he's done or things that he's heard on how accurate those things are. I don't know that they can separate a sidewalk from a street, for example. But you can, uh, that's one of the things that you can investigate and, and instigate as part of your agreement. Yeah, I think um, when Ron and I were talking about this today, I mean, there's a couple of elements here that help the uh, municipality do a little bit of control, and that is you can define where they're operated, and if they're not operated in that area, they simply shut off. Correct. Or um, if uh, somebody leaves it somewhere, it continues to charge the person whose credit card information has yes. been stored until it's retrieved. And then the other one is... Uh, they have the ability to control speed. So, you know, you can uh, dial this thing down if they're operating, let's say if they're in Aggieville or something, and you believe a prudent speed in that particular place is 10 miles an hour, then you can set that. So it's a very handy use of technology. Yes, and you can make it required, and if they violate those agreements, you can have uh, consequences mm -hmm. for that with the company. Is there? Do we have an idea how this is being used in other areas? Like, we're, I'm just still getting familiar with the terms, that, uh, micro mobility, for example, geo fencing, for example. Do we have any data or any specifics in other communities that have already embraced um, e scooters and such and to see how those mechanisms are working? Um, I know we're not a pilot city because this sure. is already being reinforced uh, enforced in some places. Um, but I don't know. That's one of the things you can actually do with your contract or with your agreement is you can have, um, and I'm sure Jared will talk about it a little bit right. more. I would like to have some data. If we're, if we're going to look at MOUs and contracts, we would like yeah. to know a little bit. So there's a lot of communities, not only in Kansas, but uh, across the country that have already entered into these agreements. And they're really, you know, we got these bullet points from those agreements. Uh, there are people who are saying, you can't operate your e-scooters past 8 p.m. or you know this pedestrian district is really uh, important and sensitive to us so we want speeds to be reduced to five miles an hour in those areas so those are things uh, that cities are you know entering into those agreements and requiring that of e-scooter companies and that's something we definitely want to look into tonight you know we're um, we're approving the ordinance that says a micro mobility company can't uh, operate in the city without entering in, into an agreement with us tonight we're not approving any agreement right so our recommendation is really going to be to go work with uh, you know k-state aggieville downtown rcpd the chamber look at uh, you know the mpo look at these agreements see what would benefit our community the most from these safety perspectives you know where should we geofence maybe k-state doesn't want these in the quad as an example right. And then we can go out with an RFP uh, to ask e-scooter companies, all right, here's basically, you know, our demands, for lack of a better word. These are the things that we want in place to ensure safety and compliance, which e-scooter which e company can do that for us. And then we negotiate that agreement right. and then come back to the city commission for that approval. Right. I, and I understand 
uh, what we're doing tonight. I just want to know how effectively geofencing is actually working. Yep. I mean, I don't want us to have something there in place if if other communities have found that that's not even working, so why are we bothering? Do we have any information if that is working in other communities? I understand how it works. I want to know if it's working. Yep. Like, are they doing it? Work. Has it been effective? I mean, I, we haven't asked that question yet, but we definitely want to ask that question of our peers. You know, Wichita and Topeka and Pittsburgh State is, uh, you know, Pittsburgh is one that recently is doing it, as well as Lawrence and then other uh, cities to see how effective it is. And, yeah. you know, are you getting what you asked for? And that's uh, what because, I want because that, that's an enforcement because if we mechanism. Ask those cities, you know, how, how are your agreements going? Is the geofencing working? And they say, no, it's terrible, it's not working at all, then. Yeah, we need to re rethink some things. Right, and that, so what I'm trying to do is not have to come back to it. Mm -hmm. So that's all I'm looking at. As I, we're putting in new terms, assuming they work, what I'm trying to do is try to get, not have that process where we have to come and undo something. And so one of, the, yeah, one of the lessons we, we have learned, I think, is that we have to have a regulation in place that requires the company to come to us the ones that have gotten real trouble had no regulation you may remember when we discussed right. this people just flood the zone with mm -hmm. these pieces of equipment and then you're no I yeah I just want to know since there's some there there must be some information if it's <coughs> working or not that's yeah. what I'm asking and we're not the first ones to there's have this. there's quite a bit of literature out there from other cities yeah. that have published their findings and publish their data and I can't I, yeah for example it is up there data sharing is is one of the things that a lot of cities have been doing and so that information is out there it's just a matter of researching and you know maybe some companies are more successful at geofencing than others and those will all be right. things that we would that the city and the would communities would know if it's working or not what I don't yeah. want to do is have our police officers having to do this because it's not working that that because uh, the enforcement mechanism here is falls on the electronic piece of the agencies that we're signing on to. And I just want to see how effective that is. So in the future, I would like to just see how geofencing is working. I understand sure. the concept. I understand what it's supposed to do. I just want to know if it's doing it. So I think as, as time goes on, I think some of that technology gets better. But there are some questions about it, definitely. Yeah, but all we're really doing tonight is forcing these companies to come to an agreement with it. Right. And the agreement may or may not include geofencing or whatever. I mean, that's a that, that's an argument we can have later. We can even not approve any of them if we like and, and not have it. But it is important that this get put in place because an individual can go buy one from Walmart. And so, you know, it, it'll take care of the individuals. We've got to cover that base first. Then this sets the stage for long-term decision on what an agreement actually entails so and, i don't have a problem with it and i will say uh you know it, it, I, i'd look for the commission for guidance but like i said our kind of recommendation would be to work with the, the stakeholders and then come back with you know some type of rfp process for one company to operate in the city if that's what we decide that we want bigger cities uh you know wichita is a good example they their you know, legal department created an agreement, a blanket agreement kind of, and then e-scooter companies came to them and said, yeah, I'll sign that agreement so I can operate. And then they had multiple e-scooter companies operating throughout their community. They're a much larger community, so that makes sense. I don't think that's going to make sense for uh, you know, Manhattan, given the small population. So you know, we're, we're, we're looking at more of an approach of let's select the best company that fits what we need uh, so that they can you know, meet all those the, those needs that we have and this is different than on campus the university would have different rules and the city would have different rules right they would have, they would have different rules for their property now regarding the streets right. and rights of way and sidewalks that would be the cities yeah. and uh, you know so when we work with that company I, I had a meeting with K-State and their administration and student body uh, last week and they're not looking to enter into any agreement. They're looking for the city to enter into that agreement. And then, you know, they can speak on whether they want them or not on campus. But that's something I think the city can work with the university if they have certain areas maybe uh, that they, you know, have certain, you know, safety concerns or anything like that. Okay. Thanks. Um, and to continue on, uh, I mentioned parks and rec facilities, and, and it came up earlier with Triangle Park. Um, 
Section 2389 of the City Code prohibits unlicensed vehicles, including motor scooters, motorcycles, mini bikes, and go karts. Um, we need to update that. That that was last admitted in 1989. Some of the terms they don't have a definition by the state statute, uh, by the STO. They're outdated. They're unclear. And so our intent at this point is to uh, provide the commission with a, a different amendment to an ordinance at a later time. Um, as what was already alluded to, with parks and rec facilities, there's a vast variety. We've got parks, we've got trails, so there needs to be some more processes put in place and, and uh, looking at that ordinance um, and approach that with you at a later time. Uh, so city administration again recommends the city approve the first reading of this ordinance amending article 5 of chapter 31 code of ordinances any, I, I'm sorry I forgot to ask generally were there any questions any further questions anybody have a question or comment or you want to hear from the pub maybe or? I, I just have a question about regulate uh, about this on private property Yes. And I'm thinking of a big parking lot, lot like at West Loop or Walmart. Um, is it up to them to develop their own rules on private their property? property? Yes. Is that if, true? if it's private That's property. That's what I would have assumed, but I just wondered. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> just so they don't have to have a sign every five feet. Okay, well, let's hear from the uh, public. Anyone wishing to comment on this topic, please come forward and love to hear from you. Thanks for coming, by the yeah. way. Good evening, uh, Mayor, Commissioners, City Manager, and, and everybody else that's here. Um, I'm Linda Cook, uh, Chief of Staff for uh, Kansas State University. And um, I'm here to talk on behalf of the university. Um, and as most of you know, we, we got into this topic probably about a year and a half ago when Bird approached the university about bringing e-scooters to campus. Um, and that's when we said, no, we need to talk with the city, um, recognize that there was not the stand, the Kansas ordinance that even allowed or recognized these uh, micro mobility devices. So we put everything on hold and actually banned them from the university at that point in time. But since that time, we have been studying this, watching what's been going on in other campuses and other communities, knowing that this day would come. Um, and we did pull a committee together that represents students, faculty, facilities, housing, security, our general counsel, and athletics. We did have Jared at the meeting on uh, last Friday. And um, as a committee, we identified the concerns that we have, um, and they basically regard safety regulations on where they can be uh, used on campus, and that includes athletics. There's concern up at the stadium, and, the, and it's a parking lot issue and the safety there. Um, and then just parking on campus. But as a committee, uh, even though there are those concerns, we recognize these devices are coming to Manhattan. Actually, we see them on campus already. Um, I see somebody, a couple of students already with their e-scooters, their electric skateboards, and it's a different kind of a one-wheel device, but they're zipping around all over campus. So they're coming, um, and it's, it's an attraction uh, for young people, um, and maybe some not so young people, because we have some faculty that want this as well. Uh, but it does help in that short trip when you don't have parking places. It's an environmentally uh, efficient type of device to get around on those the one mile one mile trip that you need to make so we see the advantages to it but where we are and we want to get behind this and work with the city um, and allow them on campus but we want to work out the ordinances that or regulations that we would have on campus that would really focus on the pedestrian and rider safety uh, particularly head injuries that's where the statistics show are the most injuries so um, it's what we do to make uh, the regulations to really protect uh, the safety of the both the riders and the pedestrians not hitting each other. Parking on campus, uh, we got to provide the, the right kind of parking and that really depends on the company you choose um, and how they designate the parking and the kind of racks that we would have on place, uh, particularly utilizing some of the bike racks, but special racks. Um, and if they're not parked in the right place, that's another way that you can use the app because it'll continue to charge them if it's not parked in the right place because that is an area where communities have problems where they're in the middle of sidewalks or they're just dumped somewhere but in this case they'll be charged if they're not in the right place 
uh, restrictions on where they can be used on campus. We don't want them in the really congested areas on campus. So that's where we would work with the city and, and the company on where we would want to geofence uh, on the campus, the areas where we don't want them to be ridden. Um, also restrictions on speeds. You can get them down to like maybe five miles an hour in some areas or a little bit higher speeds where it's more applicable. Restrictions on the hour of use. Uh, what we're seeing is most of them stop them at, you know, after eight o'clock at night, maybe seven, whatever, you can't use them. Um, also, the enforcement is a, is a major concern is how do we enforce it on campus? Our campus security can't do it all by themselves. Uh, so we recognize it'll be a, a great education training pro, uh, process and communications process on comp campus that will require some self-policing too, where people see if they're not abiding by their regulations that we have people to help uh, remind uh, users of these e-scooters um, the proper etiquette of using them on campus. Um, we, we, did, um, we also suggest that uh, the city work with a very uh, reputable company um, and we know who some of them are because we've been studying them for quite a while. Price point is also going to be a real concern for students because um, you'll hear from some students here in just a moment but price point they won't use them if they're too expensive. So that is something to, to consider. Um, and as, as Jared pointed out, the university will not be entering any contracts with any of the companies. We'll um, let the city handle that part of it and we'll just work with, with the city on the regulations that we would have on campus and up in our athletic areas. Um, communications and education uh, to the community and the user, users is critical for the success. When we read the white paper that was presented some time ago, um, that education process for users is critical. Uh, when they see the types of injuries that they can get if they fall over, um, I think that makes them a strong believer in some of the safety things that need to be considered with these devices. But they are very functional and helpful, but it's that communication and education that we think will be make the program successful. And also, starting small. Oklahoma State is an example. They started out on the wrong track. The, the electric scooters were dumped there, they had mass chaos, they banned them. But there was petitions to bring them back. So they brought and built in a lot of these restrictions and recommendations that we just talked about. They have 200 scooters, they have 50 parking spaces on campus and they're fairly neatly parked. So that's our recommendation. Thanks, Thanks. very much, very helpful, appreciate it. Please come up, yeah. We'll, we'll, yeah, she can get, you can take that to her and she can get it later then. City Manager, Mayor, Commissioners, um, it's great to see you. My name is Jansen Penny and I have the privilege of serving as Student Body President at Kansas State University. And I'm hoping to just very briefly address, you know, a few of the questions that were mentioned earlier. I know um, Commissioner Reddy as well about what, what students think. So uh, just, just a couple weeks ago, we issued a survey um, out, out to students that got over 400 responses from that. And I'm just gonna share um, some of those very key, key points from that. Um, when asked the question, would you like e-scooters on campus? There was 75% who said yes, and another 16% who were indifferent about having e-scooters on campus. Um, and then we also asked how, how often would you ride an e-scooter? And this is something that I'm honestly very surprised about. Uh, over 50% said it multiple times a week. Then 20% of students said it two to three times a month, and then another 10% two to three times a semester. And the remaining students said that they just would not use the, the scooters um, at all. And uh, the, uh, the point about the, the cost of paying for students was also brought up by um, Linda earlier. And so um, on that, as far as some of those price points, 6% of students said they would pay over 30 cents a mile for that. 39% said they'd be pay, they, they would be willing to pay between 15 and 30 cents a mile, and then another 21% between a penny and 15 cents per mile. And, um, and I can get all that information to you with, with the graphs and some of those anecdotal re responses as well for you guys to look over um, later on after the meeting. But another observation that I had, we got the opportunity to go to Oklahoma State University this past weekend with all the other Big 12 SGAs, and, um, and they do have scooters on their campus there. And so the first question I'd asked their student body president was, what has been their experience with them? 
and uh, and what and what she thought of them particularly, and um, kind of like a um, kind of like a scary story when they when they first came on they, there was no regulations and that's when it was pretty pretty rough with them when there were no speed limitations they would they could zip around wherever they were you know left in the grass and all these places and once and once the city and the university there in Stillwater worked together on what that would would look like they said the entire thing um, the entire thing flipped over as far as in the in the positive way so. All the scooters that I saw down there were were in some of those auxiliary parking spots that really can't can't be you know used that are a little bit too small for a car, or they were parked very neatly next to the racks, and um, I personally didn't see any issues there. But it was it was really cool after learning so much about um, about what we've thought of them to kind of see that in in action as well. But I definitely won't won't shy away as far as some of the concerns that a lot of students have as well. And, and that includes definitely the concerns of the pedestrians and those who choose not to ride those, and including the the, the speeds that they ride through campus around town, and then um, and then also people who may choose to uh, to ride them um, under the influence of drugs or, or alcohol, which, to my understanding, would definitely um, be illegal either way um, as well. And then, as as a previous speaker stated too, there's a lot of other schools. Wichita State, um, you know, is just starting that, and Pittsburgh State as well is just getting them introduced. I think we have many different models that we can gain some feedback from. Hear what hear what's working and what's not, and what's not working, and really find that optimal solution for for um, our city here in the city of Manhattan. But as for students go. Um, I, I will say on behalf of students there is overwhelming support with that 75% saying yes and other 16% saying they are indifferent with that. So um, I really look forward to continuing that, that conversation. As far as Commissioner Reddy mentioned earlier, regulation is going to be key and I really look forward to finding that sweet spot for our community. I just have a question for our staff. So you said um, per mile. So I was wondering, are these um, are the fees per mile or per minute? Is it per, per minute, minute? Yes. Then? Because if you said 30, 30 cents or something per mile. Yep. Sorry, I okay. I apologize on that. It is per minute, and and all the different companies do have a little different variations. And okay. first of all, what they charge, but but how they do that. Okay. A lot of them. Um, can, for instance, Bird, it is one dollar to start it if you want to ride a period, and then after that, it starts accruing. Right, and then I thought oh, it was also sure. by like time. Right. Yeah, no, yeah, because I'm asking you questions. And the other one is, oh, well, I wanted to ask our staff. Sorry, I'll wait. I broke the rules. <laughs> the rules. Put in line real fast. executive director of downtown Manhattan just want to take the opportunity every opportunity that I can to update you uh, on the discussions we've been having downtown so you probably know after 12 years of me doing this that uh, I do what I just term stakeholder surveys I'm on business day 52 of speaking to stakeholders that's an investor a property owner a business owner business manager somebody who has a stake in the direction of downtown I try to talk to everyone it's not always possible but uh, where we are right now on this particular issue is um, very clearly that those who are brick-and-mortar day-to-day -day business conducting business especially if it's um, a business where you would carry, I don't want to call anybody out, uh, where you would carry something out of that store to your vehicle and you'd have to cross the sidewalk. Um, so think maybe a cake, art, flowers, anything like that. We have lots of bike accidents where we have people that are ran over by the bikes on the sidewalks. That's that's a just a common occurrence. Um, that's the, the, the significant concern for brick and mortar businesses that that are in that walkable district 
we have signs on all of our corners. People just continue to use their wheels on the sidewalk, so I, I'm not really sure that that's working. Um, the concerns are very similar to some of the things that uh, were mentioned for K-State, and that's obviously the safety, where they're allowed to be ridden, where are they being parked? I was a little confused about that. My understanding was is dockless. I'm not understanding how the parking situation works. Um, if they just stop working or the time comes to an end, can they just lay on the sidewalk? We need some clarification on, on what happens with them when they're not in use. Um, that's probably just a question out of legitimate or um, just being ignorant because we don't know. Um, and then, of course, the ultimate question always is the enforcement piece. How is this going to be enforced? We don't have our current um, no bikes ridden on the sidewalk enforced by anybody but me. I think if you've been in a conversation with me while standing on a sidewalk, you know nine times out of ten I've left that conversation to go tell somebody to get off the sidewalk with their bike. Uh, it's just, it is self-policing, but it's um, not something that our business owners can do every day. They rely on, on an ordinance and enforcement to help them with those um, concerns. So just wanted to make sure that our side was also being represented. Nobody's, you know, totally against this. It's just, how is this going to be regulated? How are these things going to be enforced? Are we going to remain the walkable district that we worked so hard to become? Um, and, and just those things, safety, where to park, enforcement. So just things to think about again. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else, please? All right. Well, we'll come back to the uh, commission for for the question and comments? Um, I am really happy that you have found the word, the words micromobility to describe all of these variables because there'll be new names and new devices in the future. So at least uh, this is uh, something that is a comprehensive name, at least I'm, I'm hoping so. Um, I, uh, for tonight's meeting, I support certainly the uh, uh, um, entering into a contract with a provider of a uh, company, and then um, I think the devil's in the details in the future. So uh, unless there's something else I specifically need to address, um, I think safety is paramount, and uh, I have, do have concerns about pedestrians. As long as, you know, and I think the geofencing is what we would be counting on with regard to some of these more crowded areas. So uh, that'll play out uh, next time. So thanks. Well, I think this is a well done step one and puts off the real tough argument, which is uh, what goes in a network company agreement, because that's what most of us have been talking about tonight is step two. And Fortunately, that'll be in the future, but it also doesn't commit us to even have an agreement. So as part of that, I mean, we can still just decide not to make one with those companies. So I think this is the, the right way to approach it in little bites. It's well done. Yeah, certainly where we were a couple of years ago and where we are now is huge. It makes a huge difference. Um, I think being a university town and keeping our community vibrant, this is one of those pieces that goes with that. Um, as well. My question earlier was going to be, we keep hearing, I think they're pretty quiet. Uh, what is audible sound? I don't know what an audible, uh, uh, do they have a bell or do you just say something out loud? What, what is it that? Could be, it could be both or either. Um, an audible signal just on your right, on your left, or a bell or a horn, okay. which those, those items, and we can require them in an agreement. Um, but for the non-company user, in other words, a person who has purchased an e-scooter, um, they can say, hey, I'm coming up behind you, or they can use a, an auto, a bell or, Something. you know, that you can put on a, a child's bicycle. Right. Just as I long as there's some sort of warning, an audible warning mm -hmm. to the pedestrian that that person is approaching behind them. Right. Because we've seen them in Washington, D.C., 
when we went to our National League of Cities, and I've seen them in other communities as well, and people are just whizzing through, and these are people that are very comfortable, and they use it every day as a mode of transportation, um, and not just recreation, it's just how they uh, go about their business. And they usually are on sidewalks where there's multiple people and a variety of uh, things happening on the sidewalk. I think it's good to give it a shot, and I'm glad we're going to put some kind of ordinance in place and have some control over this. And I like working with the university as well. I like the data that I heard from SGA, and I, I appreciate the information that Linda Cook has provided also. Safety is key. Uh, you know, the helmets and all, I don't know how all of those work for e-scooters, uh, but I know when accidents happen, they're pretty dangerous, uh, especially on something like this. Speed is critical, and all of that we can control as we move forward. But I would certainly like more data about how, their, how other communities are enforcing, like I said, the geofencing or the speed. How is all of that working? Uh, we don't want to be, we don't want a, a major accident to happen. And if there are preventive measures from keeping that from happening, then we need that information up front as we make our decisions. We don't want to have a single one of those incidences. So let's see how that's working and what's caused all of those in the past. Thank you for, the, for your work on this. I know it took a lot of people and a lot of time. Um, one question. The, uh, when you use the uh, term curb, what exactly does that mean? I mean, you know, the curb is kind of the transition between the street and the and the right of way. So yes. is it when you say curbside, do you mean on the street side of the curb or street side curbing, yes, so yeah. the street. So they would not park on the grass or in the right of way. They would park just like a normal vehicle would. Where it's not and I I think I failed to mention that, where it's not otherwise prohibited. Right. So in our throughout the city where there's areas that it's no parking, they would not be allowed to park their bicycle, e scooter, e bike because they're a bicycle. They, they would have to follow the same rules. But in an area that a normal vehicle could park, they would park similar to how a vehicle parks, just curb, street yeah. side curb. There's a, maybe three points that I'd want to make. One is to reinforce the part of education. Um, you know, this, uh, these devices are emerging, and um, even with bicycles, we have issues. So. We really got to try to reinforce the the education part of this so that people aren't surprised, and then we don't have kind of clashes, even if they're not physical, between pedestrians and the people that use these things. The other one is that <clears throat> we have this balance that we have to reach between whether you you are safer riding in the street against a car or whether the pedestrian is safe, safer having you right on the sidewalk. And it kind of depends on speed and density, you know. So we've got to give that some thought as well. And then the other one is when, when you get downtown or in Aggieville, one of the things we're trying to achieve is some mobility. I mean, that's in the, in the name here. And so overall, we're trying to get some people out of cars into these devices so that we don't have so much traffic, we don't have so much parking issue. And <clears throat> so in order to do that, we've got to give uh, some thought to where they store the device, uh, where they park, if you will. Because it, it doesn't do as much good to have one parking stall at you know the corner of third and points if they're shopping at Sixton Points, even though there's no store there, but you get my point. Um, so as we, as we kind of work our way through this, I think it's similar to the, uh, what Linda Cook said. You know, you, you want to make sure that these things are usable, but you can't have them stowed all over the place unless it's a proper parking spot. So I just ask you to think about that, but I just echo what everybody said. I think. Uh, some really hard work has gone through this, and, and uh, appreciate you working with KSU and the community. Thank you. I don't have anything else. So, entertain a motion? Oh. Don't read it. I make the motion we approve first reading of an ordinance amending Article 5 of Chapter 31 of the Code of Ordinance related to the riding and parking of bicycles, micro mobility devices, skateboards and similar devices upon certain city properties 
and relating to the operation of micro mobility network companies upon city property. Second. Call the roll, please. Commissioner Butler. Yes. Commissioner Morse. Yes. Mayor Dodson. Yes. Commissioner Reddy. Yes. Motion carries four to zero. Okay. Thanks. We'll now move to item C, which is construction manager at risk, Aggieville Parking Garage, AG 1903, and Laramie Street Improvements, AG 1992. Um, when uh, Ron and I met early in the week, one of the things we talked about, this was originally on the consent agenda, and there's some th sometimes you find items that are uh, have been through a process but are still important and there's still some pieces that remain to be fully explained as um, you know even at this one um, we discussed prior to this meeting that the construction manager at risk term is probably not well known across the community so this is an opportunity to talk through some of these issues and and uh, finalize this and get it to an RFP. The other thing we discussed, and we'll be amending this to the uh, to the uh, motion, is that we were asked to select a commissioner to sit on the selection process, so we'll include that. So, Jared, thanks. Thanks, Mayor. Jason. No problem. Geez, no problem. Brain. <laughs> <laughs> Too many J's up here. Yeah. Um, just want to dive in here to our construction manager at risk process. Um, on May 28th, earlier this year, the Commission authorized the design for the parking garage, Laramie Street and 12th Street. And that was all with Olson, uh, Walker Parking Consultants, and BBN. So we're actively engaged with all three of those entities right now. Uh, we are starting to get some concepts in and some discussion has taken place. Um, just a reminder, Charter Ordinance 44 uh, that we passed in September of 08. Uh, basically gave the governing body the ability to procure construction of a public facility in a variety of different methods. And at that meeting, we talked about design build, traditional design bid build, and construction manager at risk. Uh, we use construction manager at risk with the uh, Flint Hills Discovery Center. Uh, we've used a variety of design build or construction manager at risk for a lot of our vertical construction. But in this proposal, we're seeking qualified construction management companies to assist us not only with pre-construction design services which they'll join that team uh, more than likely about November and then also be the company that will coordinate the construction of Aggieville's parking garage and Laramie Street I point that out because I think it's important to recognize having the same contractor on that street construction that is adjacent to the garage is very important uh, we learned some valuable lessons on some projects uh, we've done in the community, primarily the downtown redevelopment on the south end. Uh, it was vital to have the same company involved with Third Street as we were building the hotel, the conference center, and the garage. So it, 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 we, we learned some valuable lessons and we really uh, would like to see that same contractor. They're dealing with a lot of folks in the utilities and if they can coordinate things and not be pointing fingers at other contractors who are responsible for other right-of-way or infrastructure, it assists us greatly. We have an estimate right now of about $10 million for the construction of a 500-stall garage. That's roughly $20,000 per stall. Uh, just as a reminder, we spent just over $15,000 per stall for the 430 down at the, the parking garage, which we debt financed for about $6.5 million. Uh, that's construction manager at risk. Uh, will assist again with the design elements and help in estimating that total construction. Uh, we can also provide the guidance uh, along the way that we like to keep this within budget. So when we come back to you all and we're talking about uh, certain improvements within the garage themselves, whether it's facades and how we want this to look from the outside on the first floor, second floor, third floor, fourth floor and up, and then just how it functions and transitions within the facility itself. Uh, there's a lot of money you can spend inside of a garage to make it safer, uh, to make it feel more accommodating, uh, and we'll have those different components as part of uh, our design and moving forward with that price. Ultimately, that construction company then, much like they did for design build, will deliver a guaranteed maximum price to deliver the construction of both the garage and Laramie Street, and that'll be after these have been both 
100% designed by Olson, by Walker, and by BBN. Some of the advantages, we get to develop that relationship early. Uh, in a traditional design bid build, they roughly have 30 days to react. In this circumstance, we're going to get them hired in November, and it's more than likely going to be about May or June before we're under construction. So they'll have seven months to eight months with us, with our design team, working through all the components, getting feedback from the governing body and from the community. And it, it just gives them time to digest the entire project and provide pre-bid services to keep the improvements within budget. One of, uh, to me, that is it, it's one of the most critical pieces to this. The expectations are clearly defined with the construction company. If you recall, we just went out for an Asian exhibit at the zoo. We did traditional design bid build. We had a design that estimated it here, and we had a bid that came in here. And it just creates a dynamic now where we're back with the contractor trying to figure out what can we build. In these circumstances, we'll be working with that budget over that six, seven month period. And when they bring that guaranteed maximum price, it's not a matter of a result of a bid. They're delivering the price that basically we've told them to deliver and worked with them to deliver. They will receive competitive bids. They go out and competitively bid all aspects of the project, some of which their construction companies may complete, but many subs are entertained in a construction manager at risk project. Uh, we can coordinate that uh, parking garage construction construction with again the Laramie Street that mobilization will sink and that utilization of this process will coordinate our utilities in a much more uh, concerted effort. So the timeline we're looking to issue that RFP tomorrow. Uh, we're expecting those proposals to be due October 11th. The week of the 14th through the 18th the selection committee will uh, group up and we'll uh, narrow that list. We will only open the price proposals for those that we narrow, and then we'll conduct the interviews. And then we'll have a selection process towards the end of the week on the 21st through the 25th, and then make that recommendation to you all November 5th. And then the 19th, we would bring that agreement back to the governing body for action. Just a bit of a heads up and just kind of notifying you and the public, we will be hosting a public meeting the third week of October, so that'll be the week of the 21st. Uh, we'll schedule an evening meeting, more than likely happen at the pavilion uh, in City Park, and we're going to talk about all four components within Aggieville currently under design. There's the garage itself, there's a parking management plan that will be discussed, we'll have options for Laramie Street from 14th to North Manhattan, and we'll have 12th Street options from Bluemont to Morrow. Uh, and then we'll host a commission work session here on the 26th of November to talk about all four of those components. Again, we'll relay back the feedback we received in October and all the options that the consultants have provided to the community. More than likely, we'll be back in front of the governing body in February uh, with the new board and go back through what we heard and provide, get feedback so then our consultants can go finalize, if nothing else, 12th Street. Uh, 12th Street water line to connect to the hotel, which should start construction within the next couple weeks, uh, needs to occur in the April time frame. And that would be the great opportunity for us to be removing concrete, removing the pavement, getting down to the water line. And when we come back, we're coming back with the final product, uh, building to building, new sidewalks, new driving lanes, uh, new amenities between Morrow and Bluemont on 12th Street. Action this evening is authorizing uh, the construction manager at risk RFQ RFP and again as the mayor pointed out uh, appointing a city commissioner to that selection committee. Be happy to answer any questions you may have. <clears throat> um, I appreciated the mayor's introduction of the term or title uh, construction manager at risk. I understand what a construction manager is. What is the at risk part? It's that part of the contract where they're going to come forward with that guaranteed maximum price, and they're going to basically not charge us any more than that. So much like, it's, it's not a whole lot different than design build. That, con, that construction company comes forward 
with that guaranteed maximum price to build that product and they'll stand behind that. Now you may be able to realize savings throughout the bidding process and sometimes those savings can come back to the city or we can take those savings and put them right back in the facility. Those will be decisions really we'll bring back to the governing body if we do realize any of those savings. One of the, just uh, maybe to expand on that, um, there are several types of contracts and kind of if you start at one end, it's a fixed price contract. Mm -hmm. And this is essentially what that is. In other words, the you agree with the uh, developer on a fixed price. If you can't develop that, uh, deliver that fixed <coughs> price, he's liable for, depending on how you write the contract, he's right. liable for all overruns. Uh, in that type of contract, uh, you're not allowed really to see inside it all that much. You're just, it's his responsibility to execute it. Then there are some flexible opera operation uh, contracts in the middle that usually you use where you can't, you have a very hard time assessing what the real cost might be, whether it's incorporation of new technology or, so then you do various kinds of things that usually cause contract modifications over and over and over again as they try to deliver the product you ask for. And in those, they have to be very specific about how much they need, why they need it, all those circumstances. And uh, in many cases, those end up being more expensive for you. The, the other forms in there are, if uh, typically what happens is you have a, a, a developer, then you have uh, somebody who does design, and then you have somebody who does build. And trying to hand off the design to the builder causes problems on understanding constructability. And there's usually arguments back and forth about you didn't design it right, well, you didn't build it to our specs. So this, this uh, contract also heals that because you got one guy doing it. So uh, this is a relatively recent um, modification of other contract forms that um, I found quite useful, particularly on, in areas where uh, you could pretty well predict what the price of materials and time was going to be. So this will mean that we will not have the contractor coming back asking for more money, more money. I mean, in the past, and it's not been so much recently, that they have come back multiple times and sometimes drug out for a year. So by doing it this way, we're eliminating that. Yes, Is and that some true? of our past experience, <clears throat> I think just as a... A reminder um, our local contracts that we write and we govern are much different than the state contracts and the federal contracts okay. and most of our issues in, in more recent history have been a result of the state contract or the federal contract okay. that we have to administer that it's t we're told to administer it this way yeah. have caused us the trouble uh, and they're more than likely traditional design bid build and some of the things that Mike was, uh, Mayor was just pointing out are what you have where an architect and the contractor are just butting heads with you know sure. this is the way it was designed no the spec should have been this and there's just arguments in the field and we end up dealing with change orders we get caught that in are, the middle yes yeah. and and we end up spending a lot more money than we thought mm -hmm. and it's it's frustrating for everybody sure. at all levels um, when our past experience with either design build or construction manager at risk have been extremely positive uh, it is a competition really based on qualifications and who we want to go with that has that experience and has proven themselves in other communities with this type of product that's who we'll be looking for but it won't be a result of a, a bid where we're really honed in on that price on what somebody can build something for based on 30 days of review and we've found ourselves with 30 days of review with contractors who've literally walked into the construction meeting and said I didn't really look at the specs I put it I put together a price and I, I won the bid mm -hmm. and and now here we are dealing with okay they don't agree with the design so vertical construction where we don't have the expertise in-house uh, from my personal perspective you're going to see a lot more of us asking for design build and construction manager at risk because we simply don't have that expertise where rob and brian are out bidding streets and water lines and sewer and, and storm and those guys are experts uh, 
there's confidence in going to the market and knowing what we're going to hold there so them to a certain more of standard. So it's a fixed price situation. The words that bothered me were the words at risk, and which it, what you're describing is a construction manager with no risk to the city. Correct. Okay. More risk to them. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Thanks. I just appreciate all the explanation. I would I'm, just. I, would I feel just, reassured. <laughs> <laughs> I would just add that you know it's not impossible. That there wouldn't be an increased price but it would have to be something that we we decided after the project had started for example in the garage you may not like the way a facade turned out but it was done to the design and you want to add something to it and you both agree to do that based on a new price proposal but if the, if the it would be it's something. it's rare right for that to happen but if we decided to add something, right. then there'd be an ex I mean, it would be understandable to have a price change. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Good to have this discussion. Okay. Ask the, uh, <clears throat> if there's any public comment on this item. Okay. Seeing none, we'll come back to the commission for a further comment or a, or a motion. Mm -hmm. I authorize the issuance of request for the qualifications request for proposals for a construction manager at risk contract for the parking garage AG1903 and Laramie Street AG1902 improvements in Aggieville and appoint uh, Commissioner Butler to serve on the selection committee. A second. I'll second. Call the roll please. Commissioner Morse? Yes. Mayor Dodson? Yes. Commissioner Reddy? Yes. Commissioner Butler? Yes. Motion carries 4 0. Okay. Well, that was the last item, so we'll stand adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>